event equals emphasis 0519. And if you'd like to tweet about today's webinar, um, please use the hashtag GAAD for Global Accessibility Awareness Day or hashtag GAAD2016 and remember to tag emphasis at at emphasis. So today's presentation is titled Bringing Digital and Accessibility Together on this uh, wonderful day, Global Accessibility Awareness Day. Specifically, we're going to look at lessons learned from the journey in the federal sector, the education space, and from users of assistive technology. On the screen now is our agenda for today. Um, I'm going to start with some opening remarks just talking about what accessibility is and what are some of the drivers behind accessibility. Then I'm going to pass it off to Eric Bridges, who is the Executive Director of the American Council for the Blind. And he's going to talk about some of the advocacy that his organization has done across verticals. Then speaking will be Timothy Cregan. He's the Senior Accessibility Specialist at the U.S. Access Board. He's going to talk with us about the journey the federal government has taken and the lessons learned. Deb Kaplan will follow him. She is the Section 508 Policy Lead for the Department of Health and Human Services. And she's going to talk about the journey of the education system and lessons learned. Then we're going to hear from Marla Runyon, Senior Accessibility Specialist for Perkins School for the Blind. She's going to talk with us about screen readers and screen magnifiers. Then we'll hear from Gary Morin, who's going to speak to us um, from the National Institutes of Health. Uh, he is an accessibility program analyst. And he's going to talk about voice control software. Then we'll hear from Sean Zdenek, the associate professor at Texas Tech University. He's going to talk about captioning, and specifically how captioning goes beyond mere transcription. And then lastly, I'll close things out with a few final thoughts. As I said, I wanted to start us off with a common working definition for accessibility. Accessibility is just the degree to which something can be used by individuals with disabilities. So we're talking both about physical spaces and physical things, as well as digital spaces and digital content. The term accessibility applies to both. The more accessible something is, the more it can be used, engaged, and interacted with individuals who have disabilities. There are many laws dealing with accessibility, again, both in the digital space and in the physical space. Today's focus, though, is going to be largely on digital accessibility and access to information. And the prevailing standards for digital accessibility are the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines 2.0, which is great. Um, it, it's nice to have one set of technical standards that all the different verticals can look to and abide by. And then it makes information access flow more easily between each of the verticals. So by having that common set of technical standards, education, for example, can leverage things that the government does and puts out on their website. Likewise, the government can leverage private sector information, if appropriate, or education information. So it's great that there's these one prevailing set of standards that all of the verticals seem to be agreeing on and heading towards. I think it's important to talk about, too, why accessibility matters. And there's many different reasons for that. And I've got some listed here, and they're not in any specific order. But one of the reasons accessibility matters to organizations is the legal mandates. Legal mandates, um, Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act, the 21st Century Video and Communications Act of 2010, and the Americans with Disabilities Act. There's also been many lawsuits in this space showing that advocacy groups are paying attention and that change needs to happen. So to the right on this slide, 
I've got some logos for some of the different organizations that are involved in accessibility advocacy. We've got the Department of Justice, the National Federation for the Blind, the American Council for the Blind, and the National Association of the Deaf. Below those are logos for some of the companies that kind of got in trouble uh, for not having accessible digital content. And I think the most notable one is Target. Then there's the National Basketball Association, H&R Block, Harvard, Ticketmaster, Netflix, Carnival, and several banks. So there's this legal driver for digital accessibility. But also, businesses do see this as a growth opportunity. Number one, businesses don't want to lose existing customers just because they can no longer support their access to information. A good example are aging customers, individuals who might have declining vision, declining hearing, etc. You don't want to lose their patronage just because, for example, your website can't be, font can't be resized or what have you. Secondly, a lot of organizations have strategic growth goals. And one of the growth, one of the ways to grow your company and your, your client base is to make sure that you're reaching individuals with disabilities. So again, it makes sense from a business perspective to make sure that your content is accessible. And then lastly, accessibility and inclusion are simply the right thing to do. No one is going to say, accessibility is bad. I don't want individuals with disabilities to be able to use my content. That is just the wrong line of thinking all across the board. So accessibility is just the right thing to do. Well, good afternoon, and uh, I appreciate being invited to participate on a webinar like this. My name is Eric Bridges, and I'm the Executive Director of the American Council of the Blind. We are a leading national membership organization of people who are blind or visually impaired. We've been around for roughly 65 year, 55 years, I apologize, and uh, we're very much a, a bottom-up organization. Our, our membership has a, a great deal to do with uh, the work that we and, and initiatives that we work on on a national basis. Uh, if you want to move to the second slide, Chris. Um, we okay. Technology is uh, sort of at the core of everything uh, that, we, that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. In fact, it is nearly impossible to escape technology in one way or another. And for people who are blind or visually impaired, um, it, it can be an extremely empowering experience when interfacing with technology that is uh, accessible and eminently usable, or it could be a huge frustration. Uh, as you may know, or maybe you don't know, using the term blindness is a, it's a pretty general term that covers an, a wide spectrum of, of vision loss. Uh, Chris, if you want to go to slide three. Uh, the spectrum of vision loss is rather, is rather large. And so folks who are blind or visually impaired, uh, the, the overwhelming majority, have some level of usable vision and uh, may rely upon assistive technology to, to interface with certain aspects of technology. Um, and this is a, a segment, the blind and visually impaired community, it's a segment that is growing rapidly. In, in fact, by roughly 2030, the population will have doubled. And this is essentially the baby boomers. And uh, the, the boomers are really the first population of, of individuals who are aging that have really interfaced on a day-to-day -day basis as part of their job or uh, for entertainment purposes with technology in a, in a real meaningful way and are not likely to go quietly into the night as they begin to lose their vision and, and learn to have to figure out how to interface with some of these same, same devices and software and applications um, 
that they had been using before they lost their vision. So if you want to move to slide four, uh, there are a myriad of, of challenges that unfortunately the blind and visually impaired community still faces in accessing information and or uh, communication. And uh, they're, they're listed there. And they're all pretty, in the, in the grand scheme of things, these are pretty vanilla challenges that we face. But they are absolute barriers at time for us to be able to purchase goods and services online, access information, be able to uh, effectively and efficiently navigate a website to, to obtain information. Uh, this impacts our effectiveness and efficiency at work in the education realm, as well as uh, just going out and uh, you know, getting on, uh, on social media. So uh, unfortunately, these are issues that in, in our world we feel like should be handled fairly easily, but for a lot of different reasons, they, they still aren't. Uh, Chris, if you want to go to the next slide. Uh, one of the, the challenges that, that we have seen and that we've talked a lot with technology companies about is uh, not so much the lack of commitment to accessibility because uh, companies increasingly are quite interested for reasons that Chris uh, relayed uh, in his presentation from a, from a legal and regulatory standpoint and also from a, from a, a business standpoint. But what, what they face is a, uh, is a candidate pool that really has not been taught the basics of accessibility through computer science, engineering, uh, HCI, and other disciplines. Employment candidates that are going to work for technology companies, and by the way, a technology company, in, from my standpoint, isn't just a company in Silicon Valley, but it's a company that has a, a web presence, has a has a mobile app. Um, you know, there are lots of companies out there that don't consider themselves technology companies uh, because they have brick and mortar, uh, you know, locations and headquarters, but are doing a tremendous amount of business online. These companies aren't finding candidates with the requisite background in accessibility. And for many years, ACB has been talking to the technology companies as well as the world of academia about this need. It's all well and good uh, to hire folks, but then once you hire individuals, Oftentimes, these folks get put on projects, and unintentionally, through uh, just through sheer ignorance at times, break accessibility. Uh, and then issues need to be remediated. So, this this uh, project, the Teach Access project, is something that ACB is taking a leadership role in from an advocacy standpoint. That brings together academia and the technology community to talk through uh, what basics in accessibility look like, how, how accessibility can be taught at the college level, and, and what sorts of uh, assistance the technology community can give to academia uh, in helping to promote accessibility creating classes. There are universities around the country that do teach accessibility. Please don't misunderstand me. But they, it is a, it's a relative handful compared to the amount of schools that have computer science and engineering programs. Our view is that the more someone is educated at a young age on the basis of, basics of accessibility, the better, more well-rounded employment employee candidate they will be at a major techno, uh, technology company, or it could be a, a small startup. The other aspect of the Teach Access Project really looks at how do we get uh, the basics to folks who may be uh, app developers, you know, folks that aren't currently in school, 
but are interested in how to make their app accessible, uh, which is also extraordinarily important. Uh, these are all areas that we, we know are not, this isn't a quick fix, but we feel it's a foundational uh, sort of initiative that eventually, if, if done correctly, will begin to bear fruit. What we want are for folks that work on accessibility inside companies to be able to innovate. And right now, the individuals that are working on accessibility inside companies, and dare I say inside the government, they're not innovating. What they're doing is remediating issues that uh, well-meaning fellow employees have uh, unintentionally created. So it's a, it's a challenge. Uh, do you want to move to the, to the slide about advocacy successes? Uh, in December, uh, through our, our long time work in the technology community, we engaged uh, Microsoft in a, in a series of discussions. And, and this went essentially to the very senior levels within Microsoft to, to talk about the need for a commitment to accessibility, a renewed commitment to accessibility. And Microsoft and ACB uh, were able to announce a partnership to look at accessibility, the accessibility of the, of the software and applications inside Microsoft. Uh, it's, it's a massive organization with a lot of products and that, that frankly the general public is heavily reliant upon. And stuff ranging from Office 365 as well as developer tools. Um, blind people and visually impaired people need to be able to have meaningful access to these applications and uh, be assured that those products are going to be there and they're going to work and they're, they're not going to crash. And, it, and Microsoft's just one example, but Microsoft has made a, a significant commitment to doing this and we are happy to be working with them in a very substantive manner to um, provide real-time feedback as well as uh, help to get the word out about accessibility uh, enhancements or improvements that they're making with their applications. We've been working uh, with a myriad of different industries, one of which is uh, Major League Baseball since 2009-2010. Our community is not unlike any other community. We love baseball. <laughs> and sports in general, and having access to not just MajorLeagueBaseball.com, but the, the team websites that Major League Baseball operates, as well as their app, which, by the way, is a fantastic app, um, something that the app bat app, something that I use uh, on a weekly basis, um, is huge. You know, it's not all just about work. It also... Uh, you know, folks with disabilities uh, like to have fun too and uh, want to be entertained. And so Major League Baseball has been a, a great partner um, with, uh, with us. And then the final example of a lot of examples, frankly, is, uh, is Netflix. And in this agreement, um, we were able to announce last month. And uh, the, the key to, to this is that more and more entertainment content is going online and going to subscription services like Netflix. There are a lot of movies that Netflix have, has that are now audio described, which is great. And audio description is, a, is basically the, the visual made verbal. It is a, a, a voice that describes all of the nonverbal aspects of a, of a TV show or a movie and uh, does not get in, in the way of the dialogue that is taking place. And so it helps to add a lot of extra color. It leaves me no longer wondering what happened, um, you know, in a fast-paced show like Daredevil. Um, 
as well, Netflix is is now doing uh, audio described content for their original series like House of Cards and Orange is the New Black as well as Daredevil. So pretty cool stuff. And and to kind of wrap it up, Netflix has agreed to make necessary enhancements um, to their to their website as well as their app to make those more accessible because the content doesn't do us much good if we can't access it independently and, and uh, accessibly. So uh, if you want to move to the last slide. We are a, a national membership organization, as I said, and we don't, you know, we're an advocacy organi organization. We don't uh, tout ourselves as the IT consultants for all blind people, but the value that we have to, to companies is in our members. Our members represent the entire cross-section of blindness and vision loss, as well as soci socioeconomic and other demographics. And uh, we would love to find ways to be able to work with you. We have a very proud history of collaborating with companies in all sectors to ensure that products and services are made accessible. Uh, please visit us at acb.org to learn more about our mission and to, to get involved with us. With that, uh, thank you so much. Okay, good afternoon everyone and welcome to um, my portion, the Access Board portion of the webinar today on accessibility. What I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be speaking to the legal background behind accessibility and how the U.S. government defines the term. Okay, so um, the first slide that I have up is the title, which is the U.S. Access Board and the refresh of the Section 508 standards. Uh, my name is Tim Krigan. As Chris said, my title is I'm a Senior Accessibility Specialist, and this is uh, we're here on today's webinar. All right, I'm advancing this. I'm now in slide two. Slide two uh, is about the U.S. Access Board. Um, we are an independent executive branch agency, and our budget this year is a uh, little over $8 million. We have 28 people on staff full-time, and we're divided into three sections. We have the Office of Administrative Services, which includes the Executive Director, as well as our Compliance and Enforcement Division. We have the General Counsel's Office, which oversees Compliance and Enforcement. And then we have the Technical and Information Services Office, which is what I'm a part of. Uh, very briefly, um, what each of those three groups do, uh, administrative services, as you would think, you know, takes care of our needs such as you know housing and building and so forth. And the general counsel's office is responsible for um, providing legal assistance as well as providing uh, compliance and enforcement of the Architectural Barriers Act. <coughs> the responsibilities of our agency include uh, four laws, the Americans with Disabilities Act, the Architectural Barriers Act, which is essentially the ADA as applied to federal buildings and facilities, the Telecommunications Act, and the Rehabilitation Act. What I'm going to be speaking about mostly today is the Rehabilitation Act and the Telecommunications Act. What I will say for all of these laws, we're responsible for writing either standards, which are issued directly and become enforceable once we issue them, or uh, guidelines, which must then be adopted by other agencies, which are themselves rulemaking agencies. So in the case of the ADA, um, the Department of Justice is one of the rulemaking agencies that adopts our proposed guidelines, which then become standards. In the case of the Architectural Barriers Act, which is the built environment 
design requirements applied to federal buildings and facilities, we're also responsible for enforcing uh, complaints against the ABA. That section of the office is essentially separate and distinct from the rest of the office, which is involved in writing regulations. So the two sides are kept separate. So somebody sends in a complaint about the ABA, none of that information is shared with the rest of the office, which is, which is engaged in writing regulations and answering technical assistance. I'm going to move on to the third slide. Oh, the picture on this slide, by the way, is a picture of someone at a public hearing in our meeting space. We're located in downtown DC at um, 13th and F Street Northwest. We're about two blocks from the White House. The building we're in, we have a very large uh, accessible meeting room, which is what is seen in this picture. And the significance of this meeting room is it is built according to ADA specifications in terms of having uh, access to the built environment as well as electronic access for any kind of uh, information technology such as computer screens or the uh, listening systems that are in place. So next slide please. Moving on. All right. Okay, so I'm moving on to slide three. Okay, the Access Board programs. As I mentioned this before, we do guidelines and standards development under the Acts listed. So the Architectural Barriers Act, which was passed in 1968, the Americans with Disabilities Act passed in 1990, the Telecommunications Act passed in 1996, Rehabilitation Act amendments, which date from 1998, and the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act of 2010. The Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act is the one item I didn't mention previously. What we are doing is we're developing design standards for medical diagnostic equipment. What that means is, is when you go to a doctor's office and you use a examination table, these standards address transfer to examination tables or to certain pieces of large-scale diagnostic medical equipment such as scanning machines or x-ray machines. These are guidelines which are um, we will be we're providing training and technical assistance on which we'll be, be releasing. So we have the guidelines and standards development work which we do. Then the second piece is the technical assistance and training, which is what I'm doing right now. The third part is research. We have a very small research budget which we use to do research to support some of the standards writing when we're writing drafting guidelines and standards. And then finally we do the ABA enforcement as I mentioned before. Okay, I'm now moving on to slide four, um, educating about accessibility. That's an important part of our mission. And so we have a website, which is www.access-board.gov. Um, people can go there and find um, a lot of information about accessibility, a lot of technical assistance. There are captioned accessible videos, which explain uh, regulations under the Americans with Disabilities Act. There's also a significant number of technical assistance links for Section 508 and our other laws. You can sign up for our Access Current newsletter online on the front page of our website. And we also have a Twitter account, which you can follow at Act Access Board. Okay, moving on to the next slide, slide five. Now I'm going to talk briefly about the refresh of Section 508, um, which is about information and communications technology. So what this is, is a joint update of the Section 508 standards for electronic and information technology, previously referred to as E and IT. E and IT is now interchangeable with ICT. So, Electronic and information technology is the old terminology. Information and communications technology is the terminology we're using now because that is more commonly used with the rest of the world. Um, and that applies to 
electronic and information technology that is procured or obtained, used, or maintained by federal agencies. Um, we're also talking about the Section 255 guidelines, which are for telecommunications products, which are those manufactured by telecommunications uh, providers. Moving on to the next slide, slide six of my presentation. Why are we conducting a refresh or a renewal of the standards at this time? Well, there's three main reasons. There's the statutory requirement, there have been changes in technology, and it clarifies ambiguities in the existing standard. So the detail is, in the Section 508 law, we are specifically required and directed to periodically update and review and amend the standards as appropriate. In addition, there's a similar charge in Section 255 of the Telecommunications Act law, which says that the board shall review and update the what are called Telecommunications Act Accessibility Guidelines periodically. You'll notice in both of these cases, we have some flexibility because it just says it shall periodically update. It does not specify a particular time period. Um, sometimes when technology changes rapidly over a short period of time, we have to take that into account in our designs because one of the things you don't want to do is you don't want to tie your regulations into a specific type of technology because it could be obsolete before the regulations are published. So I will bring that up again later when I talk about the change we've taken in the way the standards are drafted. Um, second point, with changes in technology, again, it's been 15 years since the first Section 508 standards were published in 2001. And it's been 17 years since the Telecommunications Act Accessibility Guidelines for Accessible Telecommunications Products were published. So it's time for a change, obviously. And finally, there's ambiguities in the current standards that we want to address. For example, the current standards are written so that they talk about categories of products, such as websites, such as telephones, such as computers, desktop, hardware. But what if you have some function or some technology that doesn't really fit any of those terms? How do you address that? How do you know if it's covered? What about electronic content that's posted on websites, for example? Is that covered? How do you test this material? How do you know whether you're conformant with Section 508? These are all questions that have come up over the years. And that is why we're redrafting and revising the standards to improve the clarity and understanding. Moving on to the next slide, slide seven. I'm going to go through quickly through the steps of the refresh that we went through. First thing was is the advisory committee, which was an, uh, an open public advisory committee that anyone could apply to, which was composed of stakeholders from various groups, industry, manufacturers, academia, consumer groups, uh, some government agencies, and international groups as well. We had 41 different entities who were part of this TITAC, the T-E-I-T-A-C. It's an acronym that stands for Telecommunications, Electronic, and Information Technology Advisory Committee, TITAC. So the committee was, was established 10 years ago in July of 2006. They met every two months for two years, and they produced a report of recommendations to us in April of 2008. That report of recommendations is on our website, and you can find it. Based on what that report of recommendations said that they suggested on how we revise or change our standards, we issued what's called an ANPRM, which is an Advanced Notice of Proposed Rulemaking. When you have federal rulemaking under the Administrative Procedure Act, there are certain steps you have to follow before you can issue a final rule. One of the things that we do is we put out advance notices of proposed rulemaking to give people a sense of what we're intending to do. That advance note rulemaking leads us to, um, based on the input we get from that, that's how we revise the notice of proposed rulemaking. 
So we had an AMPRM in March of 2010. We received public comments over 90 days. We had 383 separate commenters spoke about the proposal. Based on those proposals, we revised significantly the proposed draft and issued a draft a year later. Again, we had a 90-day public comment period. We had a number of public hearings. And based on all of those comments, as well as changes in technology, I'm going to move to the next slide, we developed a proposed rule, which was the Notice of Proposed Rule Mission, the NPRM. The NPRM was published in the Federal Register in February of 2015, and we had a 90-day public comment period. Based on those public comments, we are now in the process, currently, of revising the proposed rule. Along with the proposed rule, which is the text of the proposed standards, you have what is called a preamble, which is a discussion of where all the regulations originated. So what you'll say is, well, the original rule was published in 2001, said the following about providing access in a web environment. It talked about alternative text for non-text elements, for example, images. And so we proposed change language for that based on the comments we received. Um, Tim, this is, this is Chris. It looks like we have a question from Mitesh. Um, okay. Would you like to take it now, or do you want to wait till the end of your presentation? Um, I'll take it now quickly, and then I'll get back to okay. my presentation. Go ahead, please. Mitesh, I'm going to unmute you so you can give your question. Go ahead, Mitesh. Mitesh? Yeah, I, uh, okay. yeah. Yeah. I, I'm sorry, I didn't get that because it was kind of broken up. The, the I'm sorry, Mitesh here. Um, I would just like to wait uh, till the end of the presentation because it's not directly related to this one, but my question is, uh, is there any specific regulation which mandates um, non-federal websites to follow the accessibility guidelines, uh, the revised accessibility guidelines? Okay, Chris, I'm sorry. On my end, I'm getting a lot of breaking up, so I'm really having a hard time understanding what the questioners are asking. Is it possible they could send you an email with a question, and then we could go over all of them at the end when I'm done talking? Sure, that would be fine. Um, Matesh, just type your question in the um, chat window or the questions window, um, and uh, be sure that if you type it as a chat, that in the drop downs you do select um, all entire audience, so we'll all be able to see your question, and then we'll, we'll circle back to it at the end of Tim's presentation. Uh, go ahead, Tim. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, and I've opened the chat window on my computer so I can see it as well. So I'm getting back to an overview of the, of the rulemaking process. So where we are right now is we're in hopefully the end stage of the rulemaking. We are working on the final rule, and so we're working on the final text of the rule. We're working on the preamble, which is the discussion of where all the um, proposed text came from. And we're working on the cost-benefit analysis, which is known as the regulatory assessment. The regulatory assessment basically says, this is the proposed text. This is how it would be implemented. What would be the cost of this proposed tax to federal agencies? Because this regulation, again, would apply only to federal agencies. Now, the significance is, is that a lot of other entities use Section 508 as a basis for their own accessibility. But for purposes of the rulemaking, you look to the entities where the rule is required to be applied, which is federal executive branch agencies. Once this whole package is, is assembled, that will be called a final rule. So it will be rule text, there will be a preamble, and it will be a regulatory assessment.
That whole package will be approved by the access board. It will be reviewed and voted on. And once they approve it, then it will be sent to the Office of Management and Budget for review. OMB is a subset of the uh, executive branch and it reports to the president. OMB will conduct what's called an intra-agency review, meaning that they will look at the proposed rule internally and then they will send it to other agencies within the government. The other agencies will then respond back to OMB with questions that they have. Then OMB will forward all of those questions to us and we will respond. And there will be a dialogue back and forth between OMB and the Access Board responding to this proposed rule. Once OMB is satisfied that all the responses have been made and any necessary corrections based on those questions have been made, then OMB will permit the rule to be published in the final register. Then once the final rule is published in the final register, there will be an implementation period. Typically it's anywhere from 90 to 180 days or more, but it can vary from rule to rule. So that's the process. Let me go to my next slide and just talk about some of the proposals, some of the trends we're looking at here. Understand that before the rule is published, I can only refer to those public statements we have made on the rule because if someone were to say to me, well, Tim, what's the rule about accessibility right now for federal agency websites? And I would say so the rule right now, May 16th, uh, May of 2016 would be that you follow the Section 508 standards as published in June of 2001. That's the law. Now, for purposes of today's discussion, what we have proposed in the ANTRM and then the NPRM are to change the organization of the law so that instead of talking about what something's called, we talk about what a function performs. So instead of calling it a telephone, we're talking about two-way voice communication because that's really the functionality you're concerned about. Because 20 years ago, you might have only had two-way voice communication over a landline phone wired into the wall. Today, we're having two-way voice communications over mobile phones, over uh, Wi-Fi, over a lot of different technologies. And so it doesn't benefit us to talk about the device. It makes more sense to talk about what it does. Secondly, we're going to reference external standards. Um, I've heard before today about the WCAG 2.0 standards, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines standards. We're considering referencing those for web accessibility and applying them to all ENIT. Another standard we're considering applying is ANSI, A-N-S-I, American Natural Standards Institute, C6319-2011. That standard goes to compatibility between hearing aids and telecommunications equipment. That would be important because when you're talking about using something, say, as a mobile phone, we're interacting with someone's hearing aid. So, in this proposed text, which is on our website at the, in the NPRM, you can see where we made reference to specific technical standards as a way of explaining what are the measurable criteria by which you achieve accessibility. Third thing is, is we are providing technical assistance within the document with advisors. And fourthly, we're defining the issue of covered electronic content, which is one of those things which comes up a lot because people say, well, what exactly are you talking about? Are you talking about all the stuff on your website? What about email? What about attachments to email? What about if somebody sends out a notice saying that here's a video from someone's retirement party at the agency. Does all of that have to be made accessible? So these are the kind of questions that we're faced with. So what it comes down to is we have to look at the way stuff works operationally. We have to look at what this would cost. We have to look at what we're trying to achieve, which is can individuals with disabilities, both members of the public who are trying to have access to federal services and federal employees who have disabilities, can they use 
this information and data at work. If I'm blind and I have a desktop computer at my workspace in the office, can I access it? Can I, can I get that information? That's what this really boils down to. So moving on to the next slide. Why is this rulemaking important? This is slide 10. It brings the standards and the 255 guidelines up to date with current technology. It harmonizes the accessibility standards across the federal government and also worldwide. Hopefully it will make it easier to understand and follow the requirements and it will raise the importance of accessibility for everyone. Um, there are a number of countries across the world which are working on accessibility. Europe has recently passed accessibility standards last year, which are very, very heavily based on work that we have done. So the hope is, is to make the standards harmonized across the world, so that if you make a phone, an accessible telephone, for example, in the United States, that will also be accessible in Europe and vice versa. I'm going to move on to the next slide. Um, the comments that we received in the rulemaking are posted at regulations.gov, which is a website where all federal rulemaking comments are posted. And the link is up on the screen, http colon forward slash forward slash www.regulations.gov forward slash and there's the rest of the link here. The number you're looking for is the number of the rulemaking, which is ATBCB-2015-0002. That's the docket number. It was also published in the Federal Register, and the link to the Federal Register publication is given uh, below. HTTP column forward slash forward slash www dot gpo.gov forward slash fdsys forward slash pkg, um, and then there are the Federal Register numbers. Uh, and again, moving forward, for more information, you can contact us at 508 at access-board.gov, and then we have voice and TTY numbers. So the voice number is 202-272-0080. Our 800 number is 800-872-2253. Our TTY 800 number is 800-993-2822. All right. I'm moving forward to my last slide. This is the logo of the U.S. Access Board, which is a star, red, white, and blue, with the name U.S. Access Board surrounding it. So, thank you. I um, have been very um, active in um, the whole topic area of technology accessibility for quite a while. Um, I started off working at a nonprofit organization, um, the World Institute on Disability, which is now based in Berkeley, California. Um, and while there, um, okay, while there I um, worked with uh, people both at the local and federal level on policy issues and defining technology accessibility um, as a policy issue for disability advocates to be involved in. Um, and we conducted training around technology and accessibility for disability advocates across the country traveling to different regions. Um, after that work, I went to the um, California State University system and worked in the chancellor's office. Can you see my slides? I saw the PowerPoint program icon come up. And there they are. Now we see them. Okay. Yep. Okay. All right. Um, and um, while I was at the California State University system, I oversaw the um, Accessible Technology Initiative, which dealt with technology accessibility on 24 different university campuses um, and helped to move the system um, more deeply into uh, taking technology accessibility very seriously. Um, and I'm currently working in the federal government on Section 508 for the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, so 
Chris asked me to talk about technology accessibility in higher education and what's the path um, for accessibility that institutions of higher education have have been engaged in. I thought I would start by just giving a very broad overview of what are the major issues that higher education has had to deal with or does have to deal with still with respect to accessibility. Um, the most obvious one I think for everybody is web accessibility. And there it's important to understand that we're talking not only about the internet and what is public facing, um, but also the intranet um, and all of the sites that are available to faculty, staff, and students, but not necessarily public. Um, so both inter and intranet um, need to be accessible. Um, the other major area that colleges and universities are beginning to understand and get a handle on is including accessibility in both procurement of IT and also development of IT. Um, and this means um, integrating accessibility into bids for contracts and into the contracts um, themselves to make sure that accessibility is um, a feature of technology that higher ed can count on when they're purchasing. And then also uh, making sure that um, accessibility is incorporated into the development process, um, whether technology is being developed in-house or under um, a contract. There are different considerations that also need to be taken into account to incorporate accessibility into the actual development process so that accessibility is considered from the very beginning of the development process throughout rather than treated as something that um, causes problems at the very end because it was never considered before then. Um, one of the, the sticky issues when I was there um, had to do with IT that was developed by educational consortia because that's also sometimes a source of um, apps and systems that universities will use um, and sometimes these consortia are not aware of accessibility requirements um, and um, that might come into the university system by a different vehicle than a contract and so it's important that somebody is aware of accessibility when technology is coming into the system regardless of the particular um, way that it comes in. The third major area um, that colleges and universities deal with is accessibility of instructional materials. Um, and this is very, very broad. Um, most people are think about textbooks and course reading materials. Um, there were major accessibility issues when I was there that libraries were facing because they had collections, all sorts of collections of electronic materials and um, for the most part they were not accessible. The problem with textbooks is I'll shoot you an email directly. is that um, the publishers of textbooks have them available in electronic format but don't necessarily want to make that available for students with disabilities um, in a format that is accessible. Um, and sometimes colleges and universities still have to actually break books apart and scan them in order to have accessible versions for students with disabilities to use. And this causes big problems because students need those materials really from the very first day of class and sometimes it takes time for that whole process to take place. Um, textbook um, publishers are very reluctant to provide source um, textbooks in the um, electronic formats that are accessible 
because they're afraid that that version of the book will get out beyond the student with a disability. Um, and this causes huge problems for students with disabilities that has actually led to proposed legislation um, in the US Congress. Um, but it has not gotten through yet. Um, in addition to textbooks and course reading materials, um, universities need to make sure that videos are captioned and audio described, that ebooks are accessible versions of ebooks, and large systems like learning management systems also um, need to be accessible. Um, and that's a, a fairly big job to look at those and evaluate them and make sure that they actually are accessible. So next slide, I'm going to slide number three. Um, the legal requirements that ex colleges and universities are operating under um, that require accessibility include Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. And that is a law that says that if you take federal grants or federal funding, then the programs that you operate with the federal grants need to be accessible. And higher education functions um, very dependent on federal funding for research and programs. And so Section 504 is a very important law for higher education. The regulations for Section 504 were drawn up before the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, the Americans with Disabilities Act also applies to higher education. Um, and higher education is, is covered because of the activities that they offer to students, um, which are legally considered public accommodations. They're, um, benefits or services that are made available to anybody who wants to apply and pay tuition. So it's a public accommodation like a restaurant or a theater or um, other kinds of um, businesses that are open to the public. And then um, also as an employer. Um, and so colleges and universities need to be concerned about accessibility for employees as well as for students and the public. Um, another important law for colleges and universities is Section 503 of the Rehabilitation Act, which is a law that requires federal contractors to um, make sure that their employees with disabilities um, not only are, are not discriminated against and have the same opportunities as all other employees, but there are affirmative, new affirmative action requirements and new employment goals for hiring people with disabilities that were just put in place um, in the last couple of years. Then there are various state laws that also require accessibility and that will vary from state to state. So there are a lot of laws that colleges and universities have to comply with that all require accessibility. I mean, fortunately, they all tend to require the same thing. And so it's not like they're requiring different uh, versions of accessibility. They're fairly consistent. Um, so Section 504, the first law that I talked about, um, that was the first initial legal requirement that brought accessibility to the attention of higher education. <clears throat> the regulations were issued in 1979. And um, so colleges and universities have, have been thinking about accessibility and managing accessibility for several decades. Um, when those regulations were first issued, the emphasis was on physical accessibility of the facilities. Colleges and universities needed to do um, accessibility evaluations and see how accessible their campuses were and make plans to uh, make them more accessible if there were problems. And then on um, the other area that the regulations focused on was provision of accommodations. So um, a student with a disability might need um, somebody to take notes for them. 
or students who were um, deaf might need sign language interpreters. Um, the technology back in 1979 was pretty rudimentary, and technology was not a major feature of life on campus back then. So the accessibility requirements with respect to technology were also pretty rudimentary. It might mean that students with disabilities might have the ability to bring a tape recorder to class to help them with their note taking, um, or might need brailled materials if they were blind and used braille. Um, or there might be um, a need for a large button calculator if it's a math class and calculators are used. Um, but it was not, technology was not as ubiquitous as it was today. Um, and so there was no need to think about technology in terms of accessibility um, the same way that campuses were thinking about their physical facilities, looking at them, were they accessible or not. Um, and the problem that has emerged for colleges and universities is that that initial way of looking at things um, with technology as something that you looked at just for the individual, um, that's changed as technology has become more ubiquitous. Um, so colleges and universities have needed to evolve. Um, Initially, colleges and universities established an office for disabled student services to manage making accommodations for students. And so, as I, as I mentioned, that might be the provision of assistive technology. Um, it might be note takers or sign language interpreters or providing um, a quiet place for students to take exams if they um, were distracted easily. Um, or an accessible place to take exams. Um, for the most part, these offices have had no authority to make sure that information technology is accessible. And so on the one hand, you've had these disabled student services offices making sure that students get what they need on an individual basis. But then you've had IT becoming more and more a part of campus life systems being purchased, implemented, learning management systems, um, large systems for registering and um, finding out what a, what a professor is doing um, that were purchased with no consideration of accessibility. Um, and on many campuses, I, that's I think it's still the same. Um, there, has not been an integration of accessibility into the office of the CIO or the IT organization. There may be accessibility now for web accessibility because that's a real obvious area that accessibility is generally recognized. But for all the other aspects of technology on a campus, there still are a lot of problems for higher ed. Um, one very, um, a, a lawsuit that illustrates this problem really well, a few years ago, <clears throat> Arizona State University was sued because they deployed Kindle e-readers in some classrooms. And students who were blind filed a lawsuit saying, wait a minute, we can't use the Kindle. This is back when the Kindle was first came out, and while it did provide some speech output, a person who was blind or had low vision could not navigate it on the Kindle, and there were other very serious problems for students who had blind or low vision in being able to use Kindles in any reliable way for um, their classroom materials. Um, the Arizona State University was really shocked by this lawsuit. They believed, they, they knew that they had a very strong disabled student services office. The students were generally happy with that. And they had absolutely no idea that they also needed to be paying attention 
to the technology that was being adopted on campus for everybody. Um, so there is a, a very big risk for colleges and universities with respect to inaccessibility of their IT. Um, there are several laws that apply, um, as you saw in a previous slide, and a lot of um, opportunities for barriers to exist if the IT departments are not taking accessibility seriously. Um, there's a website um, that is included in my slide. Um, it's http colon slash slash www.d.umn.edu slash, oh, how do you call that little squiggle? Sorry. For, um, um, I'm sure there's a name for that character, and I don't know what it is. Um, I think it might be a tilde. What is it called? I think it's a tilde. Tilde? Thank you, Chris. I, yeah, I never that's that's L Carlson C A R L S O N slash A T T E A M slash lawsuits dot html. Um, this particular site is um, kind of amazing. I counted 31 universities, colleges or universities or higher ed organizations. One is, um, I think it's the law school ad admission test. Um, that have had litigation and legal challenges because of inaccessibility, serious inaccessibility issues uh, with respect to technology. It goes on and on, and it's um, it's pretty interesting to look at what are all the different kinds of issues that colleges and universities have um, been sued about. Inaccessible websites, inaccessible testing, inaccessible email frameworks and apps, um, colleges and universities uh, several years ago were um, heavily um, pressured or mar marketed by both Google and Microsoft to adopt um, online cloud-based email and apps systems rather than hosting their own in order to, and it's very attractive to them because it's um, a great way to save money. However, um, some of them are not totally accessible, um, and that has caused problems. <clears throat> Lack of captions on videos, inaccessible live chat and discussion boards, and more issues. And so what you see in higher ed, I think, is an illustration of the need to really take accessibility into account way beyond your website and to look at all the different ways the technology is involved in how you do business. For colleges and universities, it's how classes are conducted and other activities that are incidental to higher ed, like the registration for classes or libraries um, and other systems that are used by employees um, to make sure that there are ways to assess accessibility and make sure that accessibility is taken into account when bringing technology into operation. So um, my next slide is, is by way of summarizing um, that it's much more than individualized accommodations. And that's true in the workplace and also for clients, I would assume that it's important to look at systems. Um, colleges and universities have incorporated technology into every way that they do business, including totally virtual campuses. Um, and so accessibility of technology is a key issue for many, many people who have disabilities who want to have access and want to be able to get an education. Um, the old methods of providing students with individualized accommodations could not address accessibility of IT. Um, and the, it's just important not to be blindsided 
by the different ways that barriers can exist and to incorporate accessibility into development, authoring, procurement, contracting, planning, governance, maintenance, and all aspects of IT. Um, it, it is a big challenge. Um, most campuses and universities have not gotten there. Most businesses have not gotten there, but some have. And so there are models to follow, but this is where things are heading. The laws are getting more sophisticated. There are more lawsuits that establish precedents that apply. And so um, that's the challenge. Um, and that is the end of my presentation. My name is Marla Runyon, and I am the Digital Accessibility Consultant here at Perkins School for the Blind. I do um, pretty much all of our, I lead our team in doing digital accessibility assessments for various clients, including higher education institutions around Boston. And just for, um, you know, just, just to give folks an idea of how a screen reader works, and also to give you kind of the experience of what it's like to use a screen reader on both an accessible web page and an inaccessible web page. So I'm not going to do the talking. I'm going to let the screen reader do the talking. I'm going to try to talk as little as possible. But I will explain a little bit as I go, but try not to over. I don't want to talk over my screen reader. So um, screen sharing, control panel paint title. Showing main screen. Screen sharing status apps. Safari, welcome to City Lights. Accessible home page, window, internal link. So this is actually a, a, a pretend page. It's a mock-up that the W3C created. It's pretty cool. It's called Before and After. And they created an, an accessible version of the domain and an inaccessible version. So I kind of like this just for demonstrations. And we're going to look at the accessible version first. So I, first of all, will give you some background as to what technology I'm using. I am on a Mac, and all Mac computers have a built-in screen reader called VoiceOver, and it's free, obviously. It's built into the operating system, which is really nice to have. Um, I also, it also has a screen magnifier called Zoom. You can use them together. They do work together somewhat. Um, but I'm just going to be demoing the um, voiceover today as a screen reader. So I'm currently um, on this website, and you'll know if you're sighted and you're watching this webinar, you will know what the screen reader is reading because you'll see what it's focused on because you'll see a black outline around the element. So I'm just going to move element by element, and you're just going to and you're just going to see and follow the screen reader. Text. Internal link. Skip to navigation within City Lights. Your access to the city image. Sunny spells, image, calendar, notification center, calendar, in two, three degrees C. Hold on, that was, an act, that was me hitting my keyboard. Try that again. Close button. Safari, welcome traffic. Construction work on today, Thursday, one nine, May 2, so heading level 2, navigation menu. Home, clickable. Visited link, news. Visited link, tickets. Visited link, survey. Heading level 1, welcome to City Lights. City Lights is the new portal for visitors and residents. Find out what's on, book tickets, and get the latest news. So moving element by element on a web page for a screen reader user is not very efficient. Um, just like anyone else, it would be much more efficient to, to be able to move more quickly and find what you're looking for. So there's lots of tricks, lots of shortcuts we can use. Um, what I can do as a screen reader user is I can actually reveal a list of certain elements on the page, and then I can move to those elements. So right now I'm going to open up um, a menu of elements. Links menu. So I open up a links menu, and you've seen. Um, so what I could do here is I can. Internal link. Skip to accessible demo page. Link image. W3C logo. Link image. Web accessibility initiative. WAI logo. So what that did was it actually opened up a window of all the links on this page. And if I just hit the Enter key here, I can place my screen reader focus on that element as a way of 
moving by links. If I were looking for a specific link, I would, might pull up my list of links on the page. But I can also move by other elements. Headings menu. Headings. So heading structure is incredibly important for screen reader users. It's such an awesome way to move and navigate your page. Um, if you have a great heading structure on your web page, that's a, it's a uh, it helps with accessibility tremendously. So here's the headings on this page. This is the accessible version, keep in mind. Heading level one, three items. Accessible home page, dash, with heading level two, navigation menu. Heading level one, welcome to City Lights. So there's my heading level one, which is similar to like the title of the page. Heading level two, link, eight way link to temperatures. Heading level two, link, man gets nine months in violin case. <laughs> heading level it's two, kind link, of comical. lack of brain time, here's research. Heading level two, elsewhere on the web. All right, so they also, you notice the heading structure is very logical, which means you have a heading level one and then you have a two. And if you had a, you want to um, nest your headings, you know, obviously, which in a logical order. So I don't want to have a four and then a three, right? I don't want to have um, a two and then a, and then a heading one underneath that, which wouldn't make sense. So they've done logical heading order here, which is nice. So we looked at links and we looked at headings as a way to navigate. Let's see if there's any other ways we can navigate. Form controls menu. So I can quickly find out if there's any forms on my page, such as a text box or combo box or like a drop down or check boxes. I could I could just go directly to those elements by by using this shortcut. No items in red spots menu. No spots menu. Links menu. Headings menu. Okay, they did not put um, Form control landmarks, menu. I'm noticing. No items in web spots menu. So no spots menu. In this particular site, they didn't use landmarks, but landmarks is, a, is an also an awesome way to navigate and um, is a way you can navigate like banner, main, footer, um, complementary information in the sidebar, and so it's a way to navigate by section, which is really helpful. So let's, um, I'm going to go ahead and close, um, let's see, let's go to our headings. Headings menu, heading level one, heading level one, welcome to City Lights. So I'm going to go ahead and choose that. Heading level one, welcome to City Lights. So I just put my focus on the element, and I'm just going to go to the next element. City Lights is the new portal for visitors and residents. Find out what's on, book tickets, and get the latest news. Heading level two, link, eight way links to temperatures. After three years of effort, city scientists now agree that the primary cause of the 2003 heat wave was hot air from. Link, heat wave, full story. All right. Heading level two, link. Man gets nine months in violin case. <laughs> Mayor, these kinds of crimes need more creative, effective I'm punishments. Skip that. Link, violin case, full story. So some things I did really well here as an, as an, as a, um, example of an accessible website is that you notice I don't, I'm not finding links that say read more, click here, um, learn more. So remember, I can I can pull up my links menu, and if I all I see is learn more, click here, click here, learn more, I have no idea where that's going to take me. So a really great accessibility um, technique is to use unique link text, and it's so easy to do, and something that actually helps enhance accessibility quite a bit. So we're going to jump now to the inaccessible version of the same page. I'm going to jump us up here, and we're going to go to internal link. Skip to inaccessible demo page. Internal link. Skip to inaccessible demo link. Image. W3C logo. W3C home. I have to jump down into the page. Headings menu. Form controls menu. No, I'm not there yet. Link. Image. W3C logo. New line. Privacy statements. Link. Member. Uh, it's going to be in the footer. New line. Privacy statements. Form controls menu, no item, window spots, links menu. Oh, that's why we didn't have any headers, because this is the inaccessible version. So I have no headers. Window spots menu, no items in, web spots menu, form controls menu, so, headings menu. So there's an example. We're, we're at inaccessible, and that's why I have... Heading level one, three items. I, inaccessible home page. So I have... Before and after demonstration, heading level one, three items. Inaccessible home page, dash, before and after demonstration. All right, so I only have one heading. I have no way to navigate this page by heading because even though there's text that looks like a heading, it was not coded as a heading. So let's see where we are now. The website using web card link. I'm going to jump down into our page. I can't move by heading. Top, top underline, weather .gif image. All right, so now we're into some images. Let's hear what a screen reader says when it lands on an image that does not have an alternative text attribute on it. Top underline, top underline, weather .gif image. 
So it's reading the file name, weather.gif image. Top underline, logo, underline, next, underline, to quick menu. Mark.gif image. Mark.gif image. Traffic. Construction work today. Click marker to underline W. Marker to underline T. Gif image. So if that makes no sense to you, it's it's not supposed to. It doesn't make any sense to me because I'm reading I'm on elements that were not coded appropriately. Link image. Nav underline home dot gif. Marker to underline W link image. Nav underline news dot marker to underline W dot gif image. Okay, so I think what we are now is we're in the links on the on the um on the left side of the page and these and these have icons and text and they didn't um, put any alt text here, so I'm hearing file names of the actual icons. Link, image, nav underline, facts, dot gif. All right, so that's an example of the impact of not putting an alternative text on an image that also serves as a link, because it, it does two things. I don't know what the image is, and I don't know where it's going to take me. Marker to underline, w dot gif, image, link, image, nav underline, survey, dot gif. Marker to underline, w dot gif, image, Blank underline 5x5.gif. Welcome to City Lights. City Lights is the new portal for visitors and residents. Find out what's on, book tickets, and get the latest news. Welcome to Blank right. underline marker 2 underline w.gif image. Link image. Nav underline survey.gif. Press like internal yeah. link. Skip to an accessible link image. W3C play app in before and after demonstration. Okay. Improving the website using web content accessibility. So I'm Headline. jumping into oh. this form because I've been here before. Survey. This week's survey, more city parks, a pain or game. So I'm going to navigate the survey by form element. Radio button, one of six. And remember, we're in the inaccessible version. Radio button, two of six. So all I'm hearing is that I'm on radio buttons, but I have no idea what they represent. Radio button, three of six. Radio button, four of six. Radio button, five of six. Radio button, six of six. They didn't label their radio buttons. If they had used um, the labeling to a, a very simple labeling technique, then I would hear what the rate what the text is adjacent to these radio buttons. Select a city. Radio button one of two. Radio button two of two. Edit text blank. Alright, so now I've landed in a text box and it does not have a label either. Because if I if I land on a text box, I'm supposed to enter something here. All I heard was edit, enter, you know, blank. And that means it wasn't labeled appropriately. So these are just examples of the challenges of, of what a screen reader user is, may encounter on a site that would be considered inaccessible. You have no heading structure. You have no alternative text for your images, including images that function as links. You have unlabeled form elements, right? So it limits how I navigate the page. It limits what I can actually access, and it Actually, in this example, I wouldn't even really be able to complete this form because I, I would have to figure out what information I would need to enter here. Um, Edit text blank. And there's yet another um, text box that does not have a label. Edit text blank. Submit button. Uh, and there's a submit button. <laughs> so we found that. Um, so this was just a very quick demonstration of, of what it's like to navigate the web with a screen reader. Um, and the difference between one one being accessible and one being very inaccessible. And you know, very simple things such as heading structure, uh, unique links, um, using landmarks. I really like landmarks. Um, labeling all your form elements. Um, they make a huge difference, and they're not that difficult to do. Um, and all these all of these issues that I've kind of identified today do map to our WCAG 2.0 guidelines. So. Um, hopefully, but those will be our new standards of web accessibility, and these are going to be um, techniques that need to be applied to be in compliance with WCAG. Um, so I'm going to stop there because I know we're pressed for time and be available for questions. Are there any questions for Marla? Okay. I'm not seeing anything in the chat. I'm not seeing any hands. Oh, go ahead. Okay. All right. So, Marla, thank you so much. And, um, uh, oh, I think we might have a question. Let me go see here. Uh, let's see here. 
Okay, um, Marla, one, one question that's actually come from a fellow presenter. Um, could you address accessible and text-only pages? Is that acceptable to have a text-only page? Um, a text-only page, meaning right. that... So, so to put it in context, in, in Section 508, there's a provision where if you cannot find any other way oh. to make the page accessible, you can create a separate text-only yeah. version of the page. Yeah, the, the separate what, but equal, the separate but equal approach, right? <laughs> what are your well, thoughts? On what are my thoughts on creating alternatives and creating duplicates and accessible versions? I say that's the very last thing you ever you want to do. Um, I think a couple of challenges with doing something like that is number one, you're going to have a duplicate of your entire domain. If you want to update your domain, you've got to update your, you know, you have to update your um, accessible version of that domain. But I think, I really think that the techniques that can be applied to making a website accessible, um, and as many people have already mentioned throughout this webinar, is that these techniques can be built into the design. And when they're built into the design, you're going to end up with a great product as opposed to a broken product that you're going to have to continually fix. And to me, creating alternatives is a is a is a going back to fix issue, and what we really want to start doing is building with accessibility in mind, so that in the end we have a great product. Um, and I, I think most people are going to agree with me on that. So I'm not in favor of alternatives that are separate URLs. I always feel like you you don't really know if you are getting an e the, the same identical content as the original. There's always that wondering, you know, am I getting the same, am I, am I seeing, am I accessing the same content that somebody else is? Um, and there's no way to know if you can only access one and not the other. So I think it's, it's uh, something we probably don't want to support, we, well, I don't say we don't support it, but we, we want to find, um, I think there's better ways to go about this than creating separate URLs. Um, and, and that's just my both my opinion. <laughs> I guess it's my opinion and maybe the opinion of others as well, but um, let's, make, let's make our web accessible, period, and not create one version and another version. That's what I say. Great. And uh, we have another question. Yesh has his hand up. So Yesh, I'm going to unmute you so you can ask your question. Yeah, the question is, um, as you showed this, it was quite illustrative on how complex it is to just go through a form. Um, mm -hmm. Is the process of testing this as laborious? Because you almost, this is minutia at another level of, uh, you know, just sitting through this made me impatient. And uh, I can imagine <laughs> you're trying to fill this form for, for real and how yeah. frustrating it must be. It's more a comment. I was just, just going through this was eye opening. Well, thank you. I, that was my point. I accomplished my my goal today. <laughs> I think if you were if you were frustrated and felt impatient, then you are you are right. That's what I wanted you to feel because that's what it can feel like and does feel like for people um, using any form of assistive technology to access the web, and and you can't. You can't do it. You know, you can't you can't do it as efficiently as you would like to do it, or there might just be something as simple as not labeling form elements that's preventing you from being able to complete a form or a survey or a job application or, you know, create an account on a website that you want to be a member for something. There's so many times we see forms and um, that that does become very frustrating. Um, I was trying to think of a real life example that I've encountered, but um, this this was also also very a very um, simplistic um, demonstration. I didn't. I didn't review screen magnification challenges, which um, I do have a video in my PowerPoint that I just skipped over today. But I um, because screen magnification will not come through in the webinar. You won't be able to, to simulate that. 
but I did create a couple short videos on screen magnification challenges. So those will be available. I'll make that available to you, Chris, um, to share with attendees as, as desired. I'm Gary Morin with the Office of the Chief Information Officer at the National Institutes of Health. And I want to talk a little bit about accessibility um, from the perspective of a user. There we go. Just a quick bit of background. I originally was a teacher. Um, I taught in school for the deaf for a bit in, outside of Boston. I have a degree from Gallaudet University, which, as you may or may not know, is the world's only um, bachelor's degree and master's degree granting university for deaf and hard of hearing persons specifically. Um, after work, after studying at Gallaudet, I started working as an interpreter in DC, in Boston, um, in New York as a sign language interpreter working between English and American Sign Language. Um, when I moved to DC, I started working at the National Institutes of Health as a staff interpreter. And because of such detailed work, um, high pressured work of interpreting for patients, for employees on the job, in training. We have about 60, 70 deaf employees who are doing anything from accounting to librarians to support staff to janitorial staff to PhD genetic researchers. So the diversity of deaf employees here is as great as the diversity of all employees here at the NIH, which is about 40,000 employees. Because the work is so tough and so detailed, um, it actually causes physical injury to many interpreters, uh, not just here at the NIH, but across the country. So through injuries of carpal tunnel, repetitive motion injuries, repetitive stress, um, and just aging with arthritis and things like that, I lost the ability to work as an interpreter. Um, I you know, couldn't interpret for more than 20, 30 minutes at a time, and meetings go on for hours here. Um, and more and more, I found that I needed to use speech recognition software. Um, and I've been working in the area of accessibility of technology since 2000, as Tim explained, when, the, when Section 508 first went into effect. The kind of motto that I want to leave you with, or the, the mind frame, is this question by Scott Rain. What if the first question we asked was, what is so unique about this situation that it justifies exclusion? instead of how much does it cost to make it accessible. Instead of thinking about accessibility as a financial cost, and it is an investment, and there are finances to it certainly, it's an investment in our customers or in our employees, in students. Um, going to my next screen, I want to just introduce you to what speech recognition is. I've not included a picture of myself. I think this one of the operator. Um, is much more eye-catching. To get you a look at, we're talking about automatic speech recognition or computer speech recognition. I want to be able to dictate text to my computer. I want to be able to perform computer, computer commands. So I may dictate a text, an email, a, doc, a Word document, create the text here in this PowerPoint file. But I also need to open the computer. I need to be able to log in with security and with privacy. I need to be able to open my applications, whether it's uh, Microsoft Outlook or Microsoft PowerPoint. I need to be able to orally tell the computer, open this application or open another application, to minimize an application, to switch to Internet Explorer so that I can search on Google or another web browser. Those are all commands that I can do directly to the computer so that Ideally, my, my hands never touch the mouse and never touch the keyboard. I will acknowledge up front that I'm probably halfway in between completely able to use my hands to not able to use my hands. Um, I use a combination of typing some. I have an ergonomic keyboard. I have a game controller style mouse as opposed to a traditional mouse. Um, but I'm going more and more to speech only at probably about half the day uh, for all of my dictation and for a lot of my computer commands. A technical note is that voice recognition and speech recognition are two different things. Voice recognition is actually 
computerized programming to evaluate the speech for security purposes. It's a biometric form of security similar to retinal recognition or fingerprint scanning. Um, probably based in the same technology originally, but speech recognition is related to um, a human interacting with the computer. Voice recognition is acknowledging who I am as a human, one person compared to another human. And my next screen, just a couple of distinctions to be made. The speech recognition that is speaker dependent and speaker independent. Speaker dependent software is where I've got to train the computer or the software application to match my voice. So Dragon Actually Speaking, many of you may have heard of at one time, Dragon Dictate. Dragon Actually Speaking is now actually a bit independent. I can just start using it out of the box. But the more I use it, the more it becomes used to my speech, my um, vocabulary, my pronunciation in particular. Speech dependent software basically requires that the person use their speech to train the software so that it knows when you say word X, it recognizes it as X and not X. Um, it gives you standard um, boilerplate or template language to read and then it matches word for word how you pronounce it. So it's what's really nice about it is that anybody can uh, train it to their voice whether they've got a speech impediment or they're hard of hearing and their speech has a a lisp or something different than a standard um, able-bodied person might have. Um, speech independent software you can think of as your um, your smartphone software, Siri, or I'm not sure what's on my Google Android telephone, but I can dictate a text message into uh, my Android without training it. It just, it's the software that comes bundled in and that I can't interact with in terms of um, mod uh, modifying the software. The software tools that your banking systems might have that uh, to recognize a person has called in and wants to do banking versus investment. Uh, word recognition on the telephone. Do you want to speak to an operator? Yes or no. Distinct words. Uh, do you want, um, are you calling about a problem or to purchase a new product? Um, that's going, going to be more speaker independent where it can match anybody's speech no matter where they call from or what their speech is like. Um, so as I just said, there's different types of or different amounts of speech that it can recognize depending on the software and the, the brand application. It may just be one word recognition, yes or no. Do you want an operator, yes or no. Um, what is your account number, one, two, three, and it recognizes it as three distinct uh, numbers or words as opposed to a continuous string. My account is one, two, three, and it re I don't have to pause between words. And then to the, the best level, such as I use in the workplace with Dragon Actually Speaking, is going to be something like continuous speech recognition, where I can just talk, and even if my words blend together, it's going to recognize the words. I would say I get accuracy in the 90 percentile, um, 90, 95 percent range uh, for the, the text I'm dictating. Uh, it's a little bit slower than I normally speak. I'm not sure it could keep up with my natural speech, uh, but it does pretty well. Um, there are some things that I have to take my speech slower on for it to um, understand specific commands, such as open Microsoft Outlook as opposed to open Microsoft PowerPoint. Um, but it does fairly well. My next slide, just these are the tools that are most commonly out there on the, in the market. Dragon Actually Speaking, uh, Nuance, which is the vendor that owns it, basically has bought up the field. There aren't many other brands of speech recognition software out there. IBM had one until a few years ago, IBM Via Voice, and they decided to sell it off. Nuance bought it, um, and I think IBM is looking at developing a new one on its own again. What's nice about Dragon is that it also has a legal and a medical version, which just comes with bigger vocabularies or dictionaries built in. Um, Microsoft Windows has a built-in speech recognition tool. And from a phone call I had yesterday with Microsoft, or the day before yesterday, what they tell me is that that speech recognition works even better with 
say Windows 10, which has its own built-in applications or native applications. Dragon is a standalone. It works pretty well with most products across the board. Microsoft speech recognition is going to work best with Microsoft Office products and not as well with other standalone products. Um, there is a free source out there called Sphinx, which I haven't tried yet. I'm going to give that one a try in the near future. And perhaps there's always something out there on the horizon. Um, as I said, this product that I use, Dragon, it is the most well-known. Uh, it allows me to do typical computer-based computer, com computer -based commands or tasks, uh, manage all of the applications on my computer. Um, you know, I use it more in the afternoon as my hands get tired, as they are more painful than, say, first thing in the morning where I'm fresh and my hands are relaxed. Um, the other really nice thing about using speech recognition is that it just forces me to sit back with better posture rather than hunched over the keyboard, which so many of us do, is we're hunched over the keyboard, we're pressured to do work, we put extra pressure on our hands, so it reinforces the ergonomic um, better behavioral health, I think, for me at the computer desk. Um, moving on, I want to raise some of the, and hopefully there'll be some questions around this, thinking about your environment. You know, what are the information and communication technologies in your environment? whether it's your employees who may have disabilities or your customers who may have disabilities. They're accessing technology through desktops, laptops, tablets, iPads. They may be calling in. I know my mother who's in her golden years still calls in once a week to her bank um, and asks for, gets the balance through an automated system. I think she does it all on a standard touch tone telephone. Um, would that be accessible to somebody who couldn't touch the telephone, um, who maybe had to use speed dial, and is still on a standard um, plain old telephone, POTS phone, or on a smartphone where they may or may not also be able to touch the keyboard? Can they verbally give the, the, the details, the prompts? Please put in your password. Say or press your password. Will it recognize her speech? Um, automated transaction machines, ATMs, a lot of them, if not all of them, are now accessible to people who are blind and vision impaired. They can bring a headset with them, plug it in. The screen, you can blank out the screen so that nobody else can see it, uh, which a blind person may not realize somebody's watching over their shoulder. Uh, but could I talk to the, the transaction machine? I'm not sure that we're there yet on that one. Websites, I do most of my banking online. Um, some websites, if I go to one bank versus another, I can do it by speech. Uh, my daily credit union, the website is not coded. The websites aren't designed to be compatible with whether it's JAWS, a screen reader for the blind, or Dragon Actually Speaking for people with speech, um, who are using speech recognition. And to give a sense of who would use speech recognition software, actually, where I say that I'm kind of somewhere in the middle, um, you know, it could be anybody who has a arthritic impairment or a dexterity impairment of repetitive motion injuries, somebody who is, has a birth defect. Um, they don't have a full hand with five fingers. Uh, they may have some fingers or no fingers. They may be an amputee, whether it's... Um, from birth defect or from military duty or accident. Um, so we're talking about a very wide range of people who may be needing speech to interact with the computer by speech. Do they have Parkinson's and tremors that they can't get the mouse right onto the sides of the icon because the icon is just too small to click that I want to deposit versus transfer versus pay a bill. Those icons can be very small. The, person may, the person's hand may tremor too much and not be able to get to the target correctly, whereas it might be easier to say, click deposit or click transfer, click being the, uh, the verbal equivalent of the mouse click. Um, we've got mobile banking. I could potentially be using my smartphone to deposit a check. Can I hold my telephone, my smartphone, um, firmly enough to be able to take a photo that's clear enough of the check that I then want to deposit into the bank. 
um, that could be a problem is will the phone compensate or the software on the phone compensate for my shakes my um, my tremors um, your bank their accounts may integrate with a home software program such as Quicken or TurboTax um, or each of those applications that you may not have control over say Quicken or TurboTax but is your website compatible with assistive technology and then it's up to the other vendors to also make their software accessible so very often vendors will work with one another on making their software compatible I can transfer my credit union data into Quicken or into TurboTax but can I physically do it because of a disability um, and that's where vendors need to work with one another Microsoft is working very heavily with Freedom Scientific, the maker of JAWS, a screen reader. They're working very heavily now with Dragon Naturally Speaking so that they're not doing anything on one side that's going to damage the, the acceptability, the compatibility with the other side. Um, think about it in terms of when you're doing your procurement for software development. Are you hiring employees to do software development? Are you contracting it out or buying software development? Um, if you're having an application developed, whether it's a smartphone app or an online app, um, ensure th integrating uh, in the federal government, I would say, Section 508 standards or WCAG standards um, in the business context. Are you putting into your contract for your vendors to have to comply with accessibility standards and assistive technology compatibility so that you could hold them accountable? It's so much better, so much more efficient and cheaper if you build Section 508 or whatever the accessibility standards are into the development rather than having to go back and remediate, uh, which I think somebody else talked about is there's a lot of remediation that's going on, undoing and redoing rather than just building along with uh, privacy and security, build in accessibility. Um, so that when you launch a new software product for your customers, you're launching one new software product for all of your customers rather than just some customers, the able-bodied ones, and then in the next release, oh yeah, we've got to add accessibility. Uh, loss, of, um, loss of productivity for your customers, your developers, your software developers are having to redo the work, you're having to pay them again extra. Um, and in the court of public opinion, it just doesn't look very good. Um, moving on, I just want to give an example of an accessibility issue that people encounter quite often when either sit logging in to a new site and creating an account, whether it's on Facebook or on a banking website or an investment house website. Those captures that we've all learned to live with. Capture being the computer assisted technology, computer assisted programming to tell computers and humans apart. These are two examples from the same site where you have to track with your mouse, you have to draw over a star, a square, a circle, it gives different figures. I went through it about five times and I only passed one out of five using my hands. Um, I'd never, it would never work with speech, there's no way there, it would just work. A person who's blind and is not using a mouse wouldn't be able to do it. It's really just a very limiting way to handle your security, um, as opposed to on the next screen, which is simply one, and it's one solution. It's a textual um, field that a person types in their answer. It would be accessible to anybody, and it's asking a basic logical question. Which of these five numbers is the biggest? Which of 10, 75, 5, 62, or 25 is the biggest number? Uh, the website is designed so that a screen reader for the blind, um, Dragon for dexterity impairments, would tab through correctly from one field to the next. I can read it visually, I'm sighted as much as the general population, and then can verbally answer the sentence. Um, now it doesn't say whether it has to be in numbers or letters. You know, would 62 be 62 or would it be 62 is a word or 75 actually now that I look at it um, that's something that might be a problem it might I've never seen it where it's mixed numbers and words spelled out um, that could actually pose a problem for somebody with a cognitive disability um, 
but we're always looking at ways to ensure that a website is secure and that it's not being spammed, ensure that it's not being spammed for all of your customers. Moving on, just a couple links. I think these PowerPoint presentations will be available. Um, and so I just happened to add one this morning from a uh, bank in England, I believe, that's doing more and more work with voice recognition um, testing for its customers for security. Um, in addition, I think, to uh, fingerprint um, options, such as when you go into the bank and are interacting with a teller, um, that you can verify. It's not just a, a password that you can put in, but it's the physical presence um, that ensures that you are you. My last slide, I think this is my last slide, just a few points I want to make sure that I raise um, is thinking about the diversity of people with disabilities. We often think blind and vision impaired, definitely a big part of the accessibility community or community of persons with disabilities. Um, we often think about when we are talking about videos, we think about people who are deaf and hard of hearing, the need for captions or subtitles for deaf and hard of hearing, as they're called in some countries. Um, but there's also people who may be dyslexic and are using screen readers, uh, persons with reading disabilities, dyslexia, auditory processing issues. Um, and so while my pr software, so to speak, Dragon, is designed for people with speech rec with dexterity problems, it is also used by people who are blind or vision impaired. Um, it may be used for just somebody who is, again, has a physical, has a mind hand or a brain hand coordination problem um, and just is able to is able to dictate all of the information, whether it's a student in a school um, or an employee in the workplace, um, whether or not they have the physical capability, they're just not as fluent as they are where they're able to just dictate directly with no pencil and paper or computer keyboard interfering. Um, there are, is a lot of assistive technology out there. No one's recommending that you test every screen reader with every website or with every software. Um, but think about the most common ones. You know, if you've got a website that's for personnel, for uh, employees to, or potential employees to apply for a job, DAWs, um, window eyes. There's three or four that are more common than others. Uh, Dragon, actually speaking, maybe the Microsoft product that's built in. There are, there are definitely statistics out there. Um, there's research done as to who, which assistive technology has the market share um, in the different fields of, you know, is it a vision related or dexterity related. Um, as you're developing software, as you're remediating software or conducting an in-house audit, look into vendors who can work with you who have some credibility, who have people with disabilities working with them and for them. Um, can they work together with your, your developers? Or are your software developers already educated on accessibility? So often, even still, we find that software developers, programmers, video producers coming out of colleges and universities don't necessarily think about accessibility as one of the standard uh, ways of doing business. And while you wouldn't hire anyone who doesn't think about security or privacy, you also shouldn't be hiring anybody who doesn't think about accessibility and can't integrate it. Um, whether they do it themselves or at least have an appreciation for it and can subcontract if need be with accessibility specialists. Hi, everybody. Welcome. I'd like to talk about closed captioning today. And I want to um, try to push back against this prevailing idea that closed captioning is mere transcription or simple transcription. I think there's a lot of transcribing involved, but there's a lot more complexity to closed captioning than we've uh, tended to assume. On slide two, I talk about myself a little bit. I'm a faculty member here at Texas Tech University. I teach a range of courses online and on site, undergrad and grad courses, and I am the author of a new book on closed captioning called Reading Sounds. The book discusses over 500 examples from popular movies and TV shows and every example is included as a video clip on the supplemental website 
readingsounds.net. Okay, let me jump right in with three definitions on slide three of closed captioning. I think these definitions are, are okay, uh, but I think in various ways they are, uh, they are a bit limiting. And I want to talk about a couple ways in which they are limiting. So Wikipedia defines closed captioning and sorry, closed captioning and subtitling as processes of displaying text on a screen. FCC defines closed captioning as a display of the audio portion uh, for individuals who are deaf or hard of hearing. And whatis.com says that closed captions are a text version of the spoken part. Uh, developed to aid hearing impaired people, but useful for a variety of situations. And again, I think these definitions are okay, uh, but there are a couple ways in which I might try to push back against them. First of all, the whatis.com definition reduces closed captioning to speech only. And if closed captions are intended for or designed for people who are deaf or hard of hearing, then they need access not only to speech, but to the full complement of sounds, speech, and non-speech. So the what is definition I think is a bit limiting, focusing only on speech when in fact you need access to speech as well as non-speech. So non-speech might be thunder or a phone ringing uh, or airplane noise or background, background noise, so-called so environmental sounds. One more thing I might say about these definitions before moving on is that both the FCC definition and the whatis.com definition assume that the entire portion is accounted for. So with FCC displays the audio portion seems to assume that the entire audio portion is accounted for. And the whatis.com definition refers to the spoken part as though the entire spoken part were accounted for. And if you've watched TV or movies with closed captioning, you know that closed captions don't account for the entire audio portion. I know this may sound um, a bit counterintuitive if you haven't watched TV or movies with closed captioning, but if you turn it on you realize that there are a whole bunch of sounds that are just not being accounted for, even speech sounds in the background, for example, that are not accounted for. So already I think um, these definitions are, are making assumptions about what captions do that don't reflect what, uh, what captioning really is. But let me move on to a broader definition. Instead of focusing just on sound, I prefer to focus on access. On slide four, closed captioning provides audiovisual access for viewers who are deaf or hard of hearing. And I include a frame from a movie, The Artist, and the caption, Silence Continues. Sometimes silences need to be captioned. And for me, this was kind of a revelation. I mean, it was really a kind of a mind blowing moment to recognize that closed captioning isn't simply about sound. I mean, it's mostly about sound, but it's, I think it's more broadly about providing access. And there are times when things like silences need to be identified uh, in the caption track. On slide five, just putting additional pressure on our assumptions about closed captioning, I've made a number of claims uh, in my own research about captioning as a way to kind of push back against more narrow understandings of captioning as simple transcription. First of all, closed captioning is not simple transcription. Choices need to be made. And I hope I can suggest over the next couple slides what kind of choices we might be talking about. For example, uh, closed captioners have to choose which non-speech sounds are significant, even which, which speech sounds are significant in some cases. Uh, this becomes something closer to a skill and an art. If there is an unusual non-speech sound, uh, the captioner may have to invent or uh, creatively describe that non-speech sound. Uh, I think the captioner at times needs to be a careful listener and have a really good repertoire of language at his or her disposal for creatively describing non-speech sounds. I like to joke in bullet three here on slide five that captioners don't caption sounds per se. And of course, captioning is about sound, but I think it's more fundamentally about conveying meaning in specific contexts. And I'll give you an example on the next slide. Every sound cannot be closed captioned, which I think directly takes issue with some of these more limiting definitions about closed captioning, because captioners must, especially in a complex situation like a major motion picture or television show, captioners must, must choose which sounds to caption. And then finally, I would suggest following the subtitling theorists 
that captions have the potential to produce a new text. The experience through the captions is different. It's not exactly the same for a listener who has the captions turned off. And I think I have an example here, two slides, uh, two slides from now. But let me let me try to provide a couple examples of these claims. On slide six, there's a screenshot from a television show, The Young Doctor's Notebook. Daniel Radcliffe has his back to us, and John Hamm is standing next to him. We can't see that uh, Daniel Radcliffe is turning the tap off, so the caption tells us, turns tap off, which is not a sound, right? This is an action being performed. And for me, this was another one of those sort of aha moments when I recognize that captioning is not always or simply about sound. What's important here is not how the tap sounds, right? The captioner could have, could have included something like squeak or whatever noise a tap makes when you turn it off. Instead, the captioner captioned the function that's being performed here or the act that's being performed by Daniel Radcliffe in turning the tap off. Again, this is not a sound but an action because what's more important here is not how sounds sound but what they mean in specific contexts. Here's another example. Uh, this is kind of a complex example. It's a timeline of all of the speaker IDs, the Superman and Clark speaker IDs in Man of Steel. So when, when it's not clear who's speaking, the captioner needs to identify the speaker in the captions. These are not sounds, but speaker identifiers. And so there's a transformation that happens in Man of Steel as Clark becomes Superman. But what's really interesting here is that in the soundtrack, Superman, the word Superman is only uttered three times, and it happens at the very end of the movie, 105 minutes in. And that's because probably we already know that this is about Superman or Clark becoming Superman. And so the movie is kind of coy and playful about the name Superman. But in the captions, the Superman speaker ID occurs 14 times. And I think that begins to provide us somewhat, a slightly different experience of the text. So again, the soundtrack is playful and coy about not naming Superman until 105 minutes into the movie, whereas the speaker IDs make ample references to Superman. I think this is just a small indication of how the experience through captions can be, begin to be slightly different than the experience for a listener with the captions turned off. Okay, slide eight. I'm not the only one who has suggested that captioning is more than words, and I include a couple of couple examples, two quotes, and then uh, some text from me on slide eight. So Joe Clark says, it isn't enough to tell us the mere text of what is being said. And he's talking about uh, captioning in the context of screen placement. Where you place words on the screen is also important. And then a recent tweet from Chad Iwerts quoting Brenda Bruggeman, transcriptioners are traditionally taught to capture the words, the words, but there's so much more. So this notion that captioning is just the words just transcription, I think, is taken issue by scholars and researchers who are studying captioning and recognizing the complexity involved here. And then I would just add on slide eight as well, the importance of meta-level information. So speaker IDs, uh, placement information, where, where, where captions are placed on the screen, and then also some of our assumptions about how sound works. So if lips are moving, but no sound is coming out, the captioner may need to identify that, that situation with a mouth, mouth speech caption or something like that, maybe some kind of silence caption. So there's some meta-level information as well as, um, as, well as some of the other uh, things we've been talking about. So on slide nine, what is caption quality? Uh, well, it begins with accuracy. And accuracy obviously is crucial. When people talk about closed captioning on Twitter, they talk a lot about accuracy, captions that are, that are wrong, and they might make fun of caption fails and so on with auto captioning. Accuracy is a sort of crucial criterion, and it's what people are talking about quite a bit. But there are additional criteria as well that I think we need to keep in mind as we build this kind of more complex understanding of what what captioning involves. I like the acronym PACT, which I don't think is being used uh, anywhere else. The A is for accuracy. It's placement, accuracy, completeness, and timing. You can look at a style guide like the Captioning Key Style Guidelines 
this is captioningkey.org, to get a sense of just how much is involved in creating high quality captions. It's not just transcribing accurately. You also must deal with the constraints of space and time. There's a small space at the bottom of the screen and there are reading speed guidelines as well that come into play here. And then finally, uh, when, when building captioning interfaces for users, you need to make sure that those interfaces are robust and that users can control how the captions look, giving users control over the color and the size of those captions is another aspect of caption quality that I think um, falls under interface design. So in short, quality captioning does require time, special training, and money. It's a fallacy to assume otherwise. You can't just throw, you can't just throw a bunch of newbies at the problem and assume that they're going to produce high quality captioning. In higher education, it's, it's somewhat popular to have undergraduate work studies who can supplement the captioning work um, that might be done by a third party vendor, um, which is fine as long as you keep in mind that those undergraduates need special training. Uh, the main factor that drives captioning quality is what clients are willing to pay for it. A great blog post there which is linked from the, the, full, the full PowerPoint that I think is available that talks about, um, that talks about the, role that, the role that low quality captions are playing here. And then finally, uh, there's a link to some information about costs in-house versus third-party vendors. And I'm coming at this from a higher education perspective in which a number of universities are taking a kind of hybrid approach, doing some captioning work in-house and doing um, and outsourcing some of, that, some of that work to a third-party vendor. In my own work, I've been interested in what I call the transformations of meaning. Something happens when you take sound and you turn it into writing. And I have identified and been working with seven transformations, and I'm not going to bore you with a discussion of all of these, but I do want to talk here at the end of my presentation about three of these. Uh, in short, on slide 11, captions contextualize, clarify, formalize, equalize, linearize, time shift, and distill sounds. So when we talk about equal access, uh, we have to be aware that uh, that, that the transformation from sound to writing creates a number of effects and changes, I think, has the potential to change the meaning of the text. Well, here at the end of my presentation, let me, let me talk about three of these transformations. The first one is on slide 12, captions contextualize. So what a sound means and how to caption it can only be determined in a specific context. There are a number of examples on this slide. Let me talk about just one or two. Unbuckle seatbelt. We can't see that she's unbuckling the seatbelt. And the sound itself sounds like a click. But rather than captioning that sound as a click, the captioner puts that sound in a specific context and captions the action being performed here, which is that the person is unbuckling her seatbelt. There's some weird sounds in Paul as the character in the next screenshot on the top row is mimicking a spaceship disappearing. In another context, the sounds he's making might, <laughs> might have a different meaning, but in this specific context, given the, given the visuals and the intention here, the, you know, the obvious caption is to, um, is to explain the purpose behind the sounds he's making. He's mimicking a spaceship disappearing. So this is very different than taking a kind of onomatopoeia approach or trying to, desi trying to describe sounds technically. Instead of, to, instead of trying to describe sounds in a vacuum, sounds are described within specific contexts. Maybe that's, maybe that's obvious, but I think that, that represents a kind of important shift away from the sounds to the meanings that are, that are being produced here. Another transformation of meaning, captions formalize or homogenize. It turns out that how people speak it turns out that how people speak is sort of less important than representing that speech in formal standard English. So formal English is the way in which speech is typically represented in closed captioning. There are some exceptions. You can introduce unusual spellings in speech captions, but for the most part, for the most part, speech captions are, are rendered in standard written English. If you want to call attention to somebody's drunk speech, for example, 
then you use a manner of speaking identifier. And so on this slide here, which is slide 13, there are four examples. The one I want to talk about is drunken slurring. I refer to this as drunk speech but sober captions. There's nothing that there's nothing about the speech itself that sort of looks drunk. The drunk speech looks like formal standard written English. So information about dialects and how people speak, that can be included, um, but it's not usually included in the speech itself, or it's rarely included in the speech itself. Uh, for the most part, manner of speaking is carried by these manner of speaking identifiers like distorted, stammering, slowly, drunk and slurring. And then finally, captions time shift. So it turns out that there are times when we can read faster than characters speak, and we get a little glimpse of the future here. Let me talk about one or two examples. There are four examples on this slide here. Gina screams. This is early on in the movie, and we don't know that, that this, is, this character is Gina. We just know her as a taxi driver taking Liam Neeson to the airport. That's Liam Neeson in the back seat of that screenshot. She's just supposed to be a kind of nondescript taxi driver, although she's also a famous actress. But as soon as she's given a name, Gina, we now can surmise or guess that she's going to return later. Even as she runs off, the taxi goes into the water and she rescues, rescues Liam Neeson and then runs off. We know she's coming back because she has a name. She's not just taxi driver. These are the sort of little clues and captioning that can help us uh, well, that can ruin the dramatic intensity of a scene or can, um, can give us a little, little glimpse of the future. And then the, the example, the last example is row two there on that slide, Young Tara. If somebody early on in a movie is named Young Tara, that's a speaker ID by the way, then we can probably guess that there is someone who is named Old Tara or there's an old version of Tara later on in the movie. And as it turns out, this is from Paul again, the characters return to visit Tara 60 years later. So the captions sort of give it, give it away, right? If there's a young Tara, why isn't she just Tara? She probably should just be Tara in that caption, but because she's young Tara, we sort of get a glimpse of the future, and the future involves the characters meeting at an old Tara or older Tara. So naming, the way in which characters are named in closed captions can help, uh, can help sort of time shift viewers into the future and give us give us advance or, or, or little peaks. All right, and I'm at the end of my presentation here with with a few takeaways. I think there's a lot more that could be said, um, but just in a short a short amount of time here, I wanted to give you a little taste of some of the complexities of closed captioning. It's a complex process of providing access for viewers who are deaf or hard of hearing. It requires a sensitivity to contexts and special training. Choices need to be made as sound is transformed into an accessible form of writing, a form that has the potential to create different experiences of the program for viewers. And I'll just leave you with something really, really kind of innocuous and, and minor, an M dash at the end of a caption. Uh, there are two examples here. Each caption ends in an M dash, egotistical and completely, and the M dash tells us that that character will be interrupted. This is another way in which captions can time shift a bit for us and give us a glimpse of the future. We know this character will be interrupted here. And same with the end of Taken, the other example on this slide. Um, we, we can surmise that he cannot finish the word negotiate. We can nego because he's going to be um, shot by Liam Neeson. This is the final bad guy in, in the movie Taken. Uh, but these are little glimpses here that are kind of based on something really innocuous. We now get to see punctuation in closed captioning. We can't see it in the same way in speech, right? And so we can, we have a sort of a different relationship with the text and may be able to, um, may be able to glimpse the future. I call punctuation veiled prophecy in closed captioning because it gives us these little clues the same way that names do. I think that's it. Well, well thank you very much. Well, um, I just have a few wrap-up thoughts. Um, I think there are some high-level themes that we can sort of extract, extract from all of the speakers that we've heard. Uh, number one, I think first and foremost, accessibility is important, and accessibility has to be done correctly. I think Sean's um, examples about sounds and captioning really drive that home point, 
as do the presentations from both Gary and Marla. You've got to do it, and it's got to be done correctly. Otherwise, users aren't going to be able to use your content, and they're going to be missing things. One piece that I do want to build on from both uh, Deborah and Marla and some of the other speakers is the importance of thinking about accessibility um, at sort of the programmatic level throughout the process. And that's what Emphasis does is their end-to-end -end accessibility solution. We try to help our clients think about accessibility throughout the entire life of a, of a, of a project and of a digital artifact. What we really want to do is help our clients sort of stop getting out of the remediation cycle and start thinking about how to bake accessibility in along the way, in design, in development, in QA, et cetera. So they're doing it right from the beginning. And as uh, was pointed out before, if you bake accessibility in and do it right so that you don't have to remediate after the fact, you're going to save time. You're going to save money, and um, I, I think that'll even help to build uh, brand as well. If you're an organization known for doing accessibility right the first time, so what I want to leave everyone with is just a simple piece of advice uh, for how to get started on your accessibility journey, because as we've learned, it takes time, it takes money, um, and and. There's just a lot to it, but something that any organization or business can do right now is what I've shown on this slide, which is add an accessibility link to the footer of your website. And then that link should go to a page that's all about your organization's commitment to accessibility so the public can see it um, right off the bat and know that this is an organization, this is a business that cares about accessibility and that is trying to do the right thing. That page specifically should contain three elements. It should contain a, a statement about your commitment to accessibility. Sometimes it's a paragraph, sometimes it's two. It should have a set of form fields. And as we saw from Marla's presentation, we got to make sure that those form fields are labeled correctly. And the form fields should be uh, a method by which actual users can share and report accessibility issues to you. So it's like crowdsourcing. It's free accessibility advice from actual users so that you can know what the problems are that they find. And then a last piece that I like to recommend is that there should be a summary of accessibility updates for the last 30 days. So think about it as software versioning. Whenever a new version of a software comes out, there's always that little screen that talks about bugs fixed since the last version. I think it's great to be that transparent about your accessibility, and I think there's a business case for it too. For example, let's say a user goes to your company's website. They're finding the unlabeled form fields. They're finding the images without alt text. There's no heading structure. And they decide, you know what? I'm not going to use your business. I'm going to go to another business. But let's say they come back in 30 or 45 days because for whatever reason they're not happy with that other group. And they can see right off the bat, oh, according to company X, they've put in the alt text. They've labeled the form fields. Let's see if they really did that. Oh, they did that. OK, I want them to have my business. So it can become a way to re, re, um, recapture some of the business that you might have lost by not having it right the first time around. So that is sort of uh, where I want to end our presentation. Um, I, I want to take a moment to thank our presenters. I want to thank you, the audience, for taking the time to attend. I realize this was a long webinar. And again, I want to apologize for the minor technical issues at first. 